appreciate each and every one that's gathered this morning. We do have an opportunity to worship God and to praise God, to lift up the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And as we get to our lesson this morning, I encourage you to follow along with me and consider some thoughts along living the life. You know, one of the things that we deal with, and I have it on the overhead, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, is a passage of scripture that tells us to let our life so shine. Now, did you hear what I just said? We, the passage reads, let your light so shine. What is that light? The light is the life that we're living. The light is the example that we're setting. And I'll tell you something. We are living in some challenging times. And those challenging times have really, they're here. And, and we can't hardly avoid them. But the reality is we have an opportunity presented us. Now, we need to be the kind of people that look for a silver lining in every cloud. That's just the, the hope that we talk about, and I'm planning on talking about it this morning. But we have an opportunity for us to show an example of calm, of resolve, of faith, of strength, of courage through these difficult times. We have an opportunity to show an example that, that is one of beyond this life. And I think that's very important. So living the life is important in front of the eyes of the world. But, you know, humans tend to be very skilled at idealizing others' circumstances. You know, it's interesting to me. Someone will come along and they will meet somebody new and they'll find out that they operate a business and all of a sudden in their imagination their business is just a million dollars a year and everything is just fine. Everything just comes up roses for them and no matter what they do, it's all genius and wonderful and excellent. And then you kind of realize, hey, hang on a second, I've exaggerated that. I've idealized that, and uh, we tend to do that. But on other circumstances, when we are the ones that are facing difficulty, we tend to look across the fence and go, nobody over there has any difficulty. Nobody ever has these challenges. We tend to be very skilled at idealizing other circumstances, and I guess that's where the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence old saying came from. But what is ideal? If we can sit here, stand here, and look across a fence and see what we see and think that that's ideal, how come we can't make that in our own lives? How come we can't bring that to our own selves? What is an ideal life? It's one of those challenges. I can remember back in grade school that the teachers, they would come along and say, uh, what do you want to do this summer? And we could, we could just spout off all these ideas. And they said, oh, great, write it down in 500 words. <laughs> You know, then you'd actually have to put it to paper and think about it. But here it's one of those things. What's your ideal life? If we're looking for something out there that's ideal or we're trying to see something and we see the ideal in it, why don't we see the ideal in ourselves? Why don't we see that? And why aren't we projecting that to others around us? According to God, the ideal life is one that focuses on seeking and serving him. That's a fulfilled life. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 13 says that we need to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. This is the purpose of mankind. Acts chapter 17, verse number 27, tells us that we were created so that we would seek the Lord and hope that we might grow for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. A fulfilled life is what God wants for us, and a life that's focused on seeking and serving him is a fulfilled life. But you know, also, God sees a life that's ideal as one that prioritizes him in our life. Uh, and, and I don't know if this is a proper combination of words or not, but a primary purpose position. You know, that, that's the priority. God is not ever second. God is not ever shoved to the side so that we can do something else. God always needs to have that priority. And if there is a point that I make this morning that brings change to your life more than anything else, I want that to be the point. I want that to be the... When people ask you to do something on Sundays, no, I'm worshiping God today. You know, I don't mean the whole day, but when they try to call you away from the moments like we've assembled this morning, there's, there, God has to have the priority. When somebody asks you to do something that is corrupt or sinful or something that's tempting you to sway away from God, no, the, the choice is God in a purposed priority. That's what we need. And so that's what God sees as ideal. But also God sees one that is a life that's ideal is one that's determined to seek his approval. God is over us. He created us and he has provided us with the greatest possible blessings. And because of that, God gives us regulations, rules. That's not a very popular term, 
But that's the idea. And we need to seek his approval. Now, I could have put 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15 there, because it says, approved of God. But Romans chapter 12 talks about giving ourselves to the Lord completely, giving ourselves to God completely, body and soul, all of us to the Lord, and so that we might be transformed by the things that he does, in, or the things that we do in his will. So we need a life that is ideal in God's sight. A faithful Christian should be setting an example of light and life in this world. Now, I couldn't take those two things apart. And remember, we started off this morning by quoting Matthew chapter 5 and, and putting the word life in there instead of light. Let your life so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. But we are to be that example. That's what we're striving for. We're striving to be the example that we need to be to show others the way. We're showing others the ideal benefits of a life in Christ. One of the things that, that I have come to understand from the scriptures is that we're not supposed to be just, you know, average floating along. We're not supposed to be those people. We're supposed to be people that have a, a great passion for what we do, a great, a, a great faith that centers us and anchors our life, direction. We always know where we're going. We always know what we're supposed to be doing because we have this great information in Christ that's the life, and there's great benefits to it. The life of a true Christian is founded on ideal things that only faithful Christians have. And so I want you to be challenged by these things and look at them and embrace them, enjoy them, because we all can have them, and there's no one that, can, no one that will fail in any of these things if we will determine to put God first in this life. First of all, a life transformed. One of the things that people try to sell us on <clears throat> when they're selling a product anytime you you take any product no matter what it is and you basically boil it all down to someone a person a man or a woman standing there in front of the camera holding up their product saying this will change your life that's that's what they want you to believe and they want you to believe that you need to change your life because the way your life is now is is horrible but if you just had this product that I have invented your life would be transformed. It would be so much better. There is great opportunity to be completely different. But it's not through some product. It's not through some scheme or some plan of man. You can be a completely different person as a Christian. And, and one of the things that I understand is that immediately by saying this point, I've kind of alienated a whole bunch of people that are already Christians, that are truly Christians, that have obeyed the gospel as they should, that have, you know, are living the life as they should. But I want you to also realize, if you're already a child of God, there are transformations within Christ. There are ch things that we can do, and, and the word is growth, and that's what we need to have. So don't, don't dismiss this point, but embrace the opp opportunity and possibility. Perhaps we can be different than we've ever been before. And even now, perhaps we can look at our life and evaluate and say, well, I could do more, and I could be more, and there's always an opportunity to, to respond to that with yes. Yes, you can, because we all can, regardless of who we are. So with that in mind, I want you to think about some examples. Think about some people that dramatically changed in the scriptures that we might find some incentive from. Those that, that changed because of their conversion to Christ, because of their commitment to God through Jesus Christ, his son. How about a drug dealer becoming a disciple? Not only a disciple, but we, we have a situation where he becomes a character within the scriptures. An individual who is drawn attention to in Acts chapter number 8, verses 9 through 13. We have a, an individual here, and I want you to take a look over there with me if you would. Because it's important for us to understand that these are real people who have had real backgrounds, and they've done some stuff, and they have, been, they have found forgiveness, just like we all need to. But in, in Acts chapter number 9, and beginning at verse number, or Acts chapter number 8, excuse me, and beginning at verse number 9, and reading down to verse number 13, I want you to take a look at that with me if you would. It says, there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery. Sorcery is an interesting word. It's actually translated from the Greek word pharmacia. Pharmacia. Does that sound familiar? We have like 9 or 11 of those in town. Pharmacies, right? Pharmacies are where you go to get drugs and uh, medications is what we call them commonly, but but this man was a drug dealer. He was one who practiced in those arts. It says in the city, and he astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. 
to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man has the great power of God, or is the great power of God. Then they hated him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Transformation. Now, I know that he gets himself into a little bit of a catch here, but, and he's one of those examples that we use often because he became a Christian. In truth, he was forgiven. He had his sins washed away, but he also had an opportunity to stumble very quickly and was instructed in what Christians must do to make it right. We'll talk about that a little bit later on at the end of the lesson. We have a protester and a persecutor who became a preacher, Saul of Tarsus, Acts chapter number 9, and really throughout that chapter. But Paul was breathing threats and, and threatening and, and dragging off men and women Christians, those that were new disciples of Christ, dragging them off to jail because they were conflicting with his belief in the Jewish faith. And so... He had this opportunity where he was a protester. He was a persecutor. He was one who, who had the authority from the chief priests to go and collect these people and take them away. But we learn that he became a child of God. Quite a transformation there. He was, uh, we also understand that there were some corrupt sinners who became truly convicted and committed Christians in Corinth. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, beginning at verse number 9, lists sins... Anytime we find one of those classic lists, we look over there and go, oh, wow, look at all those things. Look at those corruptions. And those people were corrupted in the way that they were before. But now they were washed and sanctified and justified. Verse number 11. We can have a life transformed. You know, these transforms, transformations do not come by magic. I think all too often people... Uh, come to the water of baptism, come to the point of obedience in the gospel, and they expect that their life is just going to be magically enhanced. Uh, you know, some sort of a supernatural endowment or something, some sort of a gift from God, and all of a sudden you're just impervious to sin, and everything is just perfect in your life. That's not true. It's not what this does. When we come to the water of baptism expecting some great, almost inexpressible feeling, we are mistaken. Now, there is certainly relief. There is certainly joy. There is certainly something wonderful in the, the sense that we've had our sins washed away. But if we're looking for some experience of the divine entrance, or if we're looking for something to, to, to take on a, a powerful new take on life where we're just, uh, just you know, like a barricaded away from any type of temptations or anything like that, we're looking for the wrong thing. You know, there are many who are seeking a miraculous or unexplainable or mystical situation in their obedience to the gospel, but it's not there. It is larger than life. It's larger than life. And I want us to understand that. We're not dealing with magic, but we're dealing with something bigger than we could ever attain to. We're dealing with something that's beyond our ability to provide. It's something that only God could provide, and I get to participate in it. That's amazing and wonderful, but it's certainly not unexplainable or mystical. The truth, of, the truth of it is baptism does not bring those wondrous sensations. It simply brings us the understanding that we have been separated from our past sins. Now, I said the word simply, and maybe that's misspoken, because I don't want to simplify it or, or treat it like it's not that valuable, because it absolutely is valuable. But the reality of baptism is that when we are properly baptized, there's no sensation other than the relief of knowing that your sins are washed away. Consider the Ethiopian eunuch. I want you to take a look over here in Acts chapter number 8 with me. We're still there. In it. I didn't turn my pages from there, but uh, just to go a little bit further into the uh, chapter itself, and I want you to pick it up at verse number 35 with me if you would. It says in verse number 35, So Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. It's interesting. Now we have an opportunity 
We have an insight. We're there in that moment. We're seeing this take place. There's Philip. There's the eunuch. They're down in that water. He has now immersed him in that water. He's lifted him up out of that water. And look what it says. Verse number 39. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Rejoicing. It made him happy. Happy that he was relieved from his sins. He learned about this opportunity of Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. The one that was prophesied from the Old Testament that came to this earth and gave his life to save those that had sinned. And this man had sinned and this man had come to the understanding of the gospel and said, see what's hindering me from being saved the same way. And so they stopped and upon his confession he baptized him and he went on his way rejoicing. We know that the Philippian jailer, the Philippian man, also rejoiced over having obeyed the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, or having obeyed God's will. Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 34. The true change comes from our willingness to repent, our willingness to understand that the problem, though it was dragging our life down, what was separating us from God was sin. And my sins and the guilt of my sins were washed away. And if I determined to stay away from those practices from now on, my life is transformed. My life is changed. Repentance is key. Repentance is the essence of the, the rejoicing and the essence of the freedom from our sins because our sins were washed away, the sins of our past. It's when one receives a fresh start of forgiveness and truly repents that we determine, you know, when we determine to cease from sin, then we begin to conquer the difficulties of this life. Because I'm not going to try to tell you, not for a second, that obeying the gospel won't help. You know, I'm not trying to try, I'm trying to dissuade anyone. Obeying the gospel will help, but it's not miraculous. It's not magical. We will still have to take on a determination. We will still have to show the world our life transformed. And that comes through our determined repentance we will begin to conquer the difficulties of this life we can begin with this particular de determination to act and to talk differently this is where the change comes before i led my own life i did what i wanted to do i did it my way i did what my friends wanted i did what the world wanted all of those things were how i conducted my life but now as a child of god my life's changed well how's your life changed because i don't walk like they walk i walk like he walked I walk like Jesus Christ walked. First John chapter 2, verse number 6, it says, If you claim him, claim to be his, then you ought to walk just as he walked. We conduct ourselves like Jesus Christ. We act and walk and talk differently than what we did before. We can have a life transformed and others will see that. We begin to act and walk and talk differently as Christians because, of, because Jesus set that example for us. We can and should show the world the true light in our life transformed, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. We also have a joy unmatched, and this comes from the result of what we talked about in our first point. But I'm not looking for some sense of happiness that will be here for a moment and, and blow away with the wind. Joy is much more than just happiness. It is deep set and long term. The joy of heaven that a child of God has cannot be taken away by difficulties in life. It cannot be taken away by illness. It cannot be taken away by, by uh, difficulties with relationships. It cannot be taken away with any of those things that, that challenge other people because we have this deep set, unreachable joy that is there for our long term for that place called heaven. Jesus said that his desire for his disciples was to have the fullness of joy. I love that passage, John chapter 15, verse number 11. I, I want you to go over there and take a look and see if you have it underlined or not, because I love that sense of full. Full always makes me feel better. You know, when I go to the refrigerator and I open the door and it's full of food, it, sounds, it looks good to me. When the, mil when the milk jug is full, you know, don't you hate that when you go there and you grab the handle of the milk jug and you pull up on it and it comes up too light and you look down there and there's two dribbles left? You know, that's not it's not what it needs to be. We need to have a full milk jug. I, I like jumping in the vehicle and not seeing the check, the, the, the add fuel light come on. I like to see a full tank of fuel. That, all those things speak of wonderful hope when it comes to, to my life, but also something even far, far more important. I want you to take, take a look over there with me, if you would, in John chapter, or John chapter 15 and verse number 11. I've been talking instead of turning, and I'll catch up with you. 
But look what it says over here, John chapter 15, verse number 11. It says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. Now, I love that. I love that statement. Because here's the thing. Once, once Jesus says that, there could have just dropped a, a period dot right there. Just boop. That's it. His joy can be my joy. And, and that's one of the things. Now, here's, here's another one of those points I really want you to get a hold of. The words that Jesus shared with us, the words of God through Jesus Christ to the Holy Spirit, to the writers, to us today in this book, these were written that we might know the joy of Christ. I love that. These words are not written to keep you down or slow you down or, or doing those things to, to encumber you. These, these are words of joy. But what else does it say in verse number 11 as it continues on? Because it does not stop right there. It says, and that your joy may be full. Full. I love that. That's the essence of it. The joy we gain and we should show is not temporary. It's not superficial. It's not purely emotional. We run, we're running into a lot of problems with this today. We're living in a time where our culture, and I don't know when it happened. I'm probably not smart enough to know when it happened exactly. But our culture has shifted from this is what is real. This is what is tangible and provable and sound. This is what is just, you know, we used to say black and white. There it is. Boom. Just set in order. That's what it is. And now it's like, so how do you feel about that? You know, two plus two is four. And I don't care how you feel about it. It's true. But we have switched to a time where, well, I don't feel like it's necessarily true. Emotions are getting us into trouble. And when it comes to the truth, we have these individuals who, who hear about Jesus Christ and say, that's the life I want. They, they want the transformation. They want the change. They want the freedom from their sins. And, and their joy is only emotional. It's all fervor. It's all whipped up. It's like a froth. But you know, it doesn't last that way. We need proven joy. We need solid joy. We need something that's unmatched by what the world offers. The joy that the world offers is passing away. You know, it's interesting when we look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and it talks about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and pride of life. It says, do not, do not love the world over the things of the world. Because the things of the world are passing away. And we say, well, yes, in the end, in the end, when Jesus comes back, all of the things of the world are passing away. But, you know, really, the essence of that is continuously. They're fleeting. They're fleeting. That's one of those things that you get a hold of and say, oh, I've got to have this. Look at that. I've got to have that. You bring it into your life. It's corrupting you. It's sinful. And, oh, man, it makes me happy. And it's fleeting. It's passing away. It's not the kind of joy that the Lord promised us. Jesus said that his desire for us, again, John 15, 11, was that he, we would have his joy and our joy would be full. As a Christian, there's much to be joyful over. We need to have rejoicing in our reunion with God. The, that's one of the struggles of, of preaching and communicating in a time like today. And I don't mean just during what we're dealing with in the last few months, but just the way that our culture has shifted, trying to convince someone they're wrong, first of all, because that's part of it, convicting. Convicting someone that they're wrong in a situation where, is anyone wrong anymore? Is anyone ever culpable for what they do anymore? So we have to understand that the very first thing we gain to bring us great joy is the fact that I was wrong and I was alienated from God. I was separated from God and there was no hope for me. But I have been reun uh, I've found reunion with God and I need to have joy over that. Romans chapter number 5, verses 6 through 11. It's too good for us not to, not to read. I don't want to just mention it. I want you to turn over there with me if you would. Romans chapter number 5 talks about the very fact that we could not do this ourselves. There's no way that we could figure it out or, or you know, push ourselves into this situation. God had to provide for us. And because of that provision, we have an opportunity to be reunited with him. And, and that's what we see over here in Romans chapter number 5. Beginning at verse number 6, it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us, that while we were still sinners... 
Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Talked about that a little bit last week. But that's that reunion with God, coming back to God. That's the first thing that should bring us joy, that I was away from God, and now I'm with God, and God knows me, and I'm his child, and I have accomplished these things through obedience to his will, made available through his son. Jesus invites us to come and find that joy. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's the joy that we need to find. There's great joy in knowing that we have been set free from sin, that once enslaved us, Romans chapter number 6, verses 17 through 18. We need to embrace that understanding. You know, we can come along and, and we can say things like, like what was said in the scriptures. You know, the, the Pharisees that have come along and they said, we've never been slaves of anyone. Well, how soon we forget, you know, how soon? We have been slaves. We are slaves of Satan. We are slaves of sin. But we have had a freedom from that. We can gain great joy in knowing we've been set free. There's also the better pathway. One of the things that, that I can't hardly stand in life is a sense of being lost. I'm not very good with directions. I, I don't know what that is. I, I, I spent my uh, growing up years with certain landmarks that always set the way. This is north, south, east, west. I could always figure that out, and then I started moving in my adult life. And I just tell you what, it's tough. And around here, I don't know why, but I had it in my brain for the first three years we lived here that Missouri was north of us. And technically, it's not. I mean, there is some of Missouri north of us. But technically, the way that we drive from this town into Missouri is east. And I'm like, how does that make sense? But anyway, so I'm just kind of, I can't stand being lost. I can't stand being out there and not knowing which way I go. I like to have a certain pathway. I like to have certain directions. I like to have that all laid out in front of me so that I just follow it along and I know where I'm going and I end up where I'm supposed to be. Well, I translate that over into my spiritual life. I, I can't stand the thought of ever being lost. I love the better pathway. I love that God has not just cut me loose and said, figure it out, kid. You know, he has set a pathway for me so that I can follow it with confidence. And that's something that brings joy to my life. Jesus said, I am the way. You know, I am the way. And so I follow the way of Jesus Christ. Jesus his, his way is narrow but achievable, but he pointed that out to me. Somebody comes along and says, now listen, the driveway is difficult to find. When you get there, the driveway is difficult to find. I like that information because I'll slow down and take a good close look. You know, and then they'll, they'll break it down and say, you know, that one spot, you got to be careful right in that one spot. Once you see that, that's when you need to pull in, you know, that kind of, that information's fine. Jesus did not say that the way unto life is narrow and difficult to, to dissuade people. He told us to, that the way is narrow and difficult so that we would slow down and take a good look and make sure that we get there. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. We can have joy in knowing that the directions are ours. Jesus, in his way, gives us joy in the way that we walk. The fruit of the Spirit I mean, it starts out with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness. Those words, all of those words are sourced from joy. When a person has joy, they will have love. When a person has joy, they'll have, that sounds redundant, right? Joy. They'll have peace. They'll have patience. They'll have all those things because they have this certain joy of knowing who they are and which way they're going. That's what we're set for. We're not going to be surprised I'll be, you know, we're humbly walking that way, but we're going to arrive at our destination. That's what we're looking for because we have the joy of knowing the road that's set out before us. We're walking in that way and we'll receive those words at the end, well done, good and faithful servant. What greater source of joy could that be? You know, regardless of what this world has thrown at us, we can be joyful over the knowledge of greater things. Now, I've got a passage on there on the overhead. It's Colossians chapter 3, verse number 2. And I want you to be mindful of this passage. I'm going to go over there and, and turn to it. I want, I want us to share it together. Because this is another one of those ones that I don't know 
there's just different times in life when this world really rises up and tries to take the attention away. There, there's just times in this life when, when the world will put things before us and, and try to get our minds away and, and try to get us to focus on difficulties. And it can happen on an individual level. And it can certainly happen on a collective level. And we're living through one of those times right now where we have so much focus on the here and now and the difficulties that we're facing. And they are true. I mean, there's difficulties out there. But let's be mindful of the fact that we are showing an example to others around us that is of light and life, that is of joy that we're talking about even now. But look what it says over here in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 2. I'm going to have to back up to verse number one to get a little traction. If then you were raised with Christ, what does that mean? He just talked about baptism. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now watch verse number two, underline verse number two or highlight it or do something to, get set your, uh, to set that apart from the rest. But it says, set your minds on things above, not on things above. Uh, not, excuse me, not things on the earth. It helps if I read it right. Not on things of the earth. What we're dealing with now is real. There's no doubt about that. But we have this joy even during difficult times. Well, how can you be such a joyful person? How can you still be happy? How can you still be looking so optimistic when everybody else's life seems to be falling apart? Because we do not focus on the things of this world. We set our mind on things above. We can and should show the world a better way by sharing our joy unmatched with them. Well, there's also one more, and it leads right from that thought to this. A hope unshakable. This world, in their dismissal of God, has left far too many souls hopeless. The end result of so many of the doctrines of men, even in religion, leaves people with a sense of hopeless because so many of the doctrines of men teach that God's either going to save you or he's not and there's nothing you can do about it that's hopelessness to me I mean what if I'm one of the ones that's lost what how can I fix this you can't you can't fix it according to their doctrine and then we have we have people come along and they say well I don't even believe in God well people being misled totally come to that conclusion not looking at the evidence that God's provided and they come to that so if you take God away you know they'll, they'll come along and say all I've done is removed one character from our existence no you've removed everything from our existence if you remove God and all you have left is hopelessness in the midst of difficulties there is something much better to which we cling. We have something much better. When, when everyone else is running around, pulling their hair out, we have a hope that is unshakable. We have a situation where we're not going to be just filled with dread and filled with fear. We're going to cling to something greater, even through difficult times. In Christ, there is a hope that we gain that cannot be shaken. I want you to look at Romans chapter 8. Now, I've mentioned this passage a couple times in the last couple of weeks. But we've not taken the time to go over here and read this passage. And I want us to do that this morning. I'm trying to kind of going through this lesson kind of quickly so I could slow down for this particular point. But I want us to look at this because, again, just as was stated in the last point from Colossians chapter 3, this world cannot be allowed to compete. We rise above. We think beyond this life. We think about heaven. We think about those places. Uh, the, that place is prepared for us. But look what it says here in Romans chapter number 8, beginning at verse number 31. What then shall we say to these things? I, now, what are these things? Now, we know that there's difficulties and there's other things that have been brought out here even in, in Romans chapter 8. Uh, but, but look at how we apply this passage without robbing it from its context and saying, what are the difficult things that we're facing today? And certainly we've got a whole lot on that list. But what shall we, you and I as children of God, what shall we as Christians, what shall we as the people who have a hope that's unshakable, what shall we say to these things? This is what we're going to say. If God is for me, who can be against me? That's what we're going to say. Own that passage. Make it your own. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give us 
all things. Freely give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. All of those us all the way through there, I want you to challenge yourself and see yourself there. Who makes intercession for me? Who makes that intercession for me before God? Jesus Christ, my Savior. Look what else it says. Who shall separate me from the love of Christ? See, there's that word. I, I need to find myself in there. Shall tribulation, shall difficult times, you know, that's the idea, tribulation. Shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. You know, I don't know what else we could face. All, everything that we're, we seem to be facing in life, it, it fits into those categories. Uh, somehow, you know, it's uh, forces from the outside coming after us. Or, or from the inside, maybe we lose our health or we lose our strength, we lose our abilities. All of those things challenge, but are they going to challenge you enough to separate you from God? That's the main course that we're talking about. It says, who shall separate you uh, from the love of Christ? Or excuse me, uh, yeah, excuse me. Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Well, why is it that they were killed? Why is it that they were sheep for the slaughter? Because they wouldn't back down. They wouldn't say no. They wouldn't deny Christ. They wouldn't reject God. And the world consumed them. But they had a greater hope. Look what it says. Yet in all these things... We are more than conquerors. You mean even if somebody had to die, they still win? Yes. In Christ, because our hope is beyond this life. Our hope is in a place called heaven that cannot be taken away. We still win. As it continues on, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, it's interesting to me. I look at that passage of Scripture, and I try to, try to imagine in my mind how difficult it can be for some individuals to serve God and, and to faithfully serve God as, as they should in and, and difficult places. And, and even now, in our, in our country and in our places and, and closer to home, we have a lot of difficulties going on, a lot of stresses and distresses, all of those things happening. And, and I look at that, and I'm, and I'm grateful that I don't have most of that list, and I'm looking at some of the list and saying, that's real life to a whole lot of people that are really close. But then we see this, this fact that we have this hope that takes us beyond all of that. But I want you to, I want you to be introduced to this one, one fact. When it started out, it did not say, what shall separate you? It said, who who will separate you? And the one person, the one person that's not on that list is you. You can separate you from God, but nothing else can. Don't let that happen. Grab a hold of the hope that's unshakable in Christ. As a person of faith, I don't understand how people are able to live without the hope of faith. I just don't get it. I don't understand how they do that, how they function without it. Everyone we know outside of Christ is still part of the all who have sinned, Romans 3.23, for all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And they're still out there in that sin. They've still come to that point where they are not acceptable to God and because of what they've done. And their sins are what separate them from God. The wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6.23. There's only one hope of freedom from that pattern of sin leading to death. Because it tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse number 23, and the very, point, very first point is the wages of sin is death, but it continues. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We need to help, we need to share that hope unshakable with those individuals. This is the time when we are setting the example of confidence when we're setting the example of a life that's changed and not based on the world's principles, when we're setting a life of, uh, uh, an example of a life of joy, when we're setting a an example of a life of hope, that's when other people are going to see it. 
When difficulties are here and difficulties are in such a magnitude that this many people are involved in it, this many people are aware of those difficulties, and you are showing the example of light and life, there's an opportunity for you to embrace the understanding that those individuals need the hope of the gospel. We need to share with them the hope unshakable. We need to share with them the joy unmatched. We need to share with them a life that can be transformed. Their life can be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news is the hope that we need to show and share. Only through obedience to the word of God can any soul be cleansed. Earlier we mentioned those individuals in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. They were cleansed and sanctified and justified. All of us need to be those things through obedience to the gospel. Nothing else will bring any of us into a living hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. A living hope. Not just, I hope, I wish, I might. No, hope. Sound, sure, and unshakable. We can and should show the world a life filled with hope that is unshakable. No matter what we must endure. In this temporary world, we can have hope for better beyond you know many are in search of some ideal life they want this ideal life you know if my life was just better if my life was just more ideal and we picture these things for ourselves but i want every one of us to be firm on this with yourself you have to be firm with yourself on this the ideal life is not something out there way beyond it is something that is found right here in this book the ideal life is right here, and it's been here all along. We need to embrace that. To have the life that God intended, we need to reach for our ideal self in a spiritual sense. We need to reach for it. We need to get a hold of it. We need to, to grow in it as we should and to show others the examples that we need. As faithful Christians, we should be setting the example of light and life to this world. And right now is a perfect opportunity to do that when so many are facing challenges we need to be the beacons we need to be the light that shines in darkness i don't know if, if you saw the overhead if you're watching this on live stream but but the very first the cover slide was a light bulb surrounded just by darkness but it was shining that light it needs to be our light the world is facing a whole lot of difficulty right now this is a perfect opportunity for us to talk about jesus to talk about transforming their life and talk about a joy unmatched and a hope that's unshakable we are to be showing others the ideal benefits of the life in christ today the opportunity to obey god through our savior jesus christ is yours submit to the doing of god's will take up your part in the transformation in the joy and in the hope that can only be found in christ and do it right now. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave you this opportunity so that you might have this moment in order to change your life. And you can change your life before you leave this place even now. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you're willing to confess that belief, know that you have sinned and determined to push those sins away, have your sins washed away in the water of baptism, rise and walk in the newness of life, and join us on the road home. There's an opportunity for you to, to get a hold of this new, wonderful hope and joy and transformation. If you are a child of God and not living the way you should, the things that I've talked about this morning are not for, they're not for the moments where we're wandering away. They're not for the moments when we're weak and consumed by sin. They're, they're not, th those are not the times where your hope and joy is present, where you have embraced the transformation. And so if you are a child of God this morning and you're not living the way you should, you need to make correction. You need to fix it so you can come back to these things. Your example cannot be what it needs to be if you're living with sin in your life. And so this morning, I encourage you, please make the changes that you require to come back to the Lord. Repent of the sin in your life. Pray to God for forgiveness. He's faithful and just to forgive you. So this morning, we offer you the opportunity to become a child of God, or come back to the Lord and let us help you as we sing the invitation hymn.